Hello and welcome to the third part of Lecture 4 on this course on Chemical Process Design. In this part of Lecture 4 we'll start to think about how to design the pressure vessel in which the reaction will take place and that heat exchange equipment and other items of process equipment may well also reside. We'll also consider aspects of safety first and foremost and recognise that by this stage in the design the vessel we're trying to build may simply be too big to be considered safe or economically manufacturable. If this is the case, we'll consider specifying two, or perhaps more, pressure vessels in parallel to increase the level of safety. Then we'll revise how to calculate vessel wall thickness and briefly introduce how pressure vessels are fabricated. I'll also give you a few examples of very large pressure vessels that have been built and are currently operating, so that you've got some guidance with which to answer the question, how big is too big? I'll end this part of this lecture by linking you to an external video that gives a very nice example of a pressure vessel being built. So here on the whiteboard is a photograph of a reactor pressure vessel. Let's just look at it for a second to see what we're aiming for. The vessel has an external heating coil around it, so it's got heat transfer equipment that's not part of the reactor volume. It's got lots and lots of flanges. Now these flanges will connect to the process, they'll connect to instruments, they'll connect to vents, they'll connect to drains, they'll connect to nitrogen systems. The vessel's got supports. We can actually stand it up without it falling over. The supports are quite tall as well because there's a drain at the bottom of the vessel. There's going to be a minimum pipe radius that can actually go from that drain and of course we want that to be able to all fit underneath the pressure vessel. If you look carefully at the top of the vessel, you also see that the head is bolted on such that it can be taken off and the internals of the vessel can be inspected. So if our ultimate aim is to get to something that looks a bit like that, we need to start somewhere. So we've started by thinking about the process design. We know about the reactant or catalyst volume, we know about the energy requirements and we know the basic hydraulics. All these are essential to proceed to the next step. We've thought about the thermal design as well. We've thought in detail about how we're going to add or remove heat from the system and whether that does or doesn't alter the pressure vessel specifications. We've thought about agitation and mixing. Firstly, whether it's required and secondly, if it is, for example, in solid liquid systems, what sort of agitator we're going to use and what sort of additional space with inside the pressure vessel that will take. We've also thought about additional components. If we've got agitators, we're going to need bearings and seals. If we've got heat exchange equipment, we're going to need some kind of mechanical support for those, likewise for catalyst beds. And if we've got a multi-phase system that involves a gas-liquid reaction, we're going to have some kind of gas sparging equipment. All these items of equipment, of course, take up space. So by the end of this design process, we should know the total pressure vessel volume, its operating pressure, and its operating temperature. So let's think safety. Safety first and foremost. The design and construction of very large thick-walled pressure vessels is possible, but it's a very, very specialist job, and they're very, very, very expensive. They also have potentially very large blast energies. Large pressure vessels operating at high pressure can have a catastrophic level of blast energy associated with them, which may make the safety case for your process untenable. If this is the case, you're going to have to say, well, this vessel is simply too big. What we're going to have is a number of small reactors in parallel, where the individual blast energy of each of those smaller reactors can be deemed to be acceptable. So, unless you're under expert guidance, and if the explosion energy and the damage radii resulting from the explosion is just simply too high, consider an inherently safer design by specifying two or three smaller reactors in parallel and reduce blast energy. Let's think about a pressure vessel design procedure. Let's assume that our pressure vessel blast energy is acceptable. What we next need to figure out is how thick the walls are and whether they can actually be welded. If you look in the excellent book by Towler and Sinnott, you will find there are vessel design procedures. And this is an excerpt from one of those, and I'll make reference to Towler and Sinnott where appropriate. So, first of all, you need to establish your design pressure. Your design pressure is 10% more than your operating gauge pressure. You also need to establish your design temperature and to choose your material. From your design temperature and your materials choice, you will figure out what your maximum allowable stress is. 
So, for example, if you've specified an expensive material, such as 316 stainless, and if your design temperature is around 150 degrees C, your maximum allowable material stress is going to be about 107 megapascal. You can find out what the maximum allowable material stresses are for a whole range of other materials by referring to Towner and Sinnott, page 982. The second thing you're going to do is to use this maximum allowable material stress and use it to calculate the thickness of the cylindrical section and of the heads of the vessel. So don't forget to add in corrosion allowances and always to round upwards to the nearest standard thickness of material, which will either be in metric units or imperial units, depending where you're working. So if we look at the formulae that are published for cylindrical shells, there are two thickness formulas that you use. What you do is you calculate the wall thickness using both of these formulae and take the larger of the two results. You then compare that result to the minimum standard thickness that is specified for the diameter of the pressure vessel that you're looking at. What you might find for low pressure systems is that the minimum thickness is some two or three times greater than the thickness that you calculate from these formulae, and so therefore you use the minimum thickness. Now, if we're thinking about vessel heads, additional formulae relate to those. For example, ellipsoidal heads, you can use the formula here on the whiteboard. For more formulae, have a look at Towler and Sinnott. And again, the same rule applies to the head as to the cylindrical shell. If the thickness calculated by that formula is below the minimum thickness, use the minimum thickness. If you've got particularly tall vessels, such as distillation columns or scrubbing equipment, or maybe an evaporator, then you're also going to need to calculate additional things. For example, the deadweight stress, the bending moment due to wind loading or ice loading, and buckling stresses. And again, in Towler and Sinnott, there are some great worked examples of this, in particular example 13.2. The next thing to do is to think about how your vessel is going to be supported. So let's look at various ways in which you can support a vessel. The photograph that I showed you at the beginning of this part of this lecture showed a vessel on legs, and so here's a schematic diagram of a vessel on legs. We can, of course, have a vessel that can span several floors of a plant. Um, the horizontal dashed line here is meant to represent a floor, and we can see half the pressure vessel is beneath the floor and half the pressure vessel is above the floor. And rather than putting this vessel on legs, what we've done is to weld two supports on the side walls and have those supports resting on some of the structural steelwork that runs between the floors of the plant. This can also be exceptionally useful if you want to put the vessel on what are termed load cells. These are sensors that register the amount of mass that is in the vessel and therefore can be used as part of a control system. For tall vessels, you typically have skirts. These are tapered cylindrical um, pieces of material in which the vessel sits. And then as the vessel goes up through plant structure, you'll find there are additional pieces of structural steelwork, scaffold type arrangements that will support vessel at various points along its height. Now, if you've got horizontal vessels such as LPG bullets, then these tend to sit in saddles, typically two saddles, but if you've got a particularly long vessel, there may well be three or four saddles on which these vessels sit. It all depends on the bending moment between the saddles. So, there's some examples of vessel supports. And so by the end of this design procedure, hopefully what you've got is a vessel with a wall thickness, a head thickness, chosen material and a specification of vessel supports. Your next question to answer is, can this vessel be built? Now, if you think about the fabrication of pressure vessels, they are welded pieces of equipment. And so the limiting factor on wall thickness tends to be the thickest material that can be economically welded to the required standard. Welding large thicknesses of pressure vessels is a very, very skilled job and you need very, very skilled craftsmen or very sophisticated automated processes in order to do this. Because when you weld, it is very, very easy to incorporate defects in that weld, void spaces typically, and any defects in a weld in a pressure vessel renders that pressure vessel unsuitable for use. Of course, there are various different types of welding technique. And so if we think about wall thicknesses and material thicknesses, you'll find gas tungsten arc welding is good for about two millimetres of thickness plasma welding about eight millimeters of thickness 
and keyhole tungsten inert gas welding may be up to 16 millimetres. Now these finished welds are non-destructively tested by x-ray or by ultrasound and if the welder is found to be defective then it is ground away and the welding process starts all over again and this is an expensive process so the fewer the defects the better. Now there's the eternal question of I've calculated this wall thickness is it too thick? Well on this table on the whiteboard are some details of some pressure vessels that have been commissioned for three large process projects over the last 20 odd years. Two of these projects are methanol synthesis projects which typically um, take place at quite high pressure, 80-90 bar, and the other is a high pressure gas to liquids process. If we first of all look at the temperatures and pressures we'll find that I'd class these as moderate temperature, 300 on degrees C, moderate pressure, 80-90 bar. Now, if we look at the materials of construction, we'll find that for those temperatures and for the material, physical and chemical properties, we're looking at high temperature alloy steels. And so this material choice will affect your maximum allowable stress. So we've got chrome molybdenum steels, we've got manganese molybdenum nickel steels. These are big vessels. Take a look at the shell diameters of these projects. They range between four and a half and seven meters in diameter. So consequently, the blast energy associated with these vessels are very, very large. Vessel wall thicknesses here range between 120 and 140 millimeters. So here is a guide for what can be reasonably welded to the required standard for these high pressure applications and what has been commissioned and designed before, so where experience exists. So what I'd like to do is to close with this link. Please go and watch this video. This is a great example of how a pressure vessel is built, starting from a sheet of um, steel through to the finished object, taking you through all the welding and rolling processes that are required to convert one to the other. It's a very instructive thing to watch, and if you're ever going to design anything, you need to know how it's made. And so here's an example of how things are made. So let's recap a few key points. So once the additional volume requirements due to heat transfer, agitation and other internal equipment is known, carefully appraise that pressure vessel volume. Look at your explosion energies. Look at the damage radii for certain given consequences. And if the safety case presented is just too hazardous, divide the vessel into a number of smaller vessels, run them in parallel, redo your process and thermal design and estimate a new pressure vessel volume and then reappraise it. If you're satisfied your vessel is sufficiently safe enough, perform your wall thickness calculations. Then again appraise the result. Decide whether your vessel wall thickness is just simply too thick to build. If it is, divide your vessel into a smaller number of parallel vessels, redo the process and thermal design and estimate the new pressure vessel volume and wall thickness. So we've seen that for established process projects, wall thickness is up to about 140 millimetres of high, of high temperature steels have been used. For point of note, the upper limit that is technically feasible to weld is almost double that, 350 odd millimetres. Now, I would advise you never go to that thickness of wall material unless you're under expert guidance. The upper limits that I've suggested with the projects that have been out there and commissioned are probably a good enough rule of thumb for the designs that you'll start to do initially.